A very good afternoon to all. I am Nishita from Clarnet. Clarnet is India's largest live digital CME and doctors generated medical content platform. The Omicron variant has ushered panic responses globally because of its contagious and vaccine escape mutations. Omicron multiplies around 70 times faster than the Delta variant in the bronchi, but the evidence suggests that it is less severe than the previous strain, especially compared to the Delta variant and is 91% less fatal than the Delta variant with 51% less risk of hospitalization. Overall, the extremely high rate of spread combined with its ability to evade both double vaccination and body's immune system means the total number of patients requiring hospital care at any given time is still of great concern. These are the very short glimpses of Omicron, but we have with us our expert doctors to dig out inside of the COVID-19 and Omicron. Clarnet has taken the initiative to arrange for a digital CME on Omicron, SARS-CoV-2 variant and children, what we know now. Now, I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Banayat. Sir has done MBBS, MD Fellowship in Pediatric Intensive Care. He is also a consultant at Nelson Hospital, Nagpur. Dr. Banayat will welcome our today's honorable speaker doctors. Now, over to you, sir. Good afternoon, all. Uh, it's my honor to welcome Dr. Dhanashekar Kesavalu. Uh, well, uh, if we see on the slides also, uh, having an intensive work, extensive work of over 12 years in uh, United Kingdom at various pediatric centers, pediatric uh, having a special interest and a special work in pediatric gastroenterology and various pediatric liver diseases. Well, uh, I'm sure uh, Nishita would uh, help me with the slide of uh, uh, to introduce our speaker, sir. Uh, with uh, over 1,000 endoscopic procedures, uh, to his credit, uh, sir has many uh, literatures, uh, review in various international journals, and a lot of medical and non-medical meetings that at international level, to his credit. Uh, he is awarded the Young Investigator by ESPAGA, Indian Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition in the year 2008. He is also selected for uh, ESPAGAN uh, Summer School in Italy in the year 2013. Uh, also, he was a TV anchor uh, for the Star Vijay Doctor Show in 2015. Well, he has many professional memberships to his credit, uh, right? And being a special interest in uh, gastroenterology, coming hailing from Tamil Nadu, uh, over to you, sir. Thank you very much, actually. When you give us an introduction about us, when what we've done in the past it makes us feel very old, actually, after hearing 2013, 18, because COVID seems to have eaten up about three years of our lives now. So this is starting in 2020, 21, 22. So you really wonder what's been going on with all these people's lives and what they've been doing. But anyway, I think the, the session for this afternoon, I don't want to take much of my time because what we would want to actually do this afternoon is to share some knowledge on actually what's actually going on. So I chose the topic as this, Omicron in children. What do I or you or we need to know is the most important thing this afternoon. Now, you already introduced me, but I just want to show you what I'm actually doing right now. So this is basically all the universities and the, the colleges and the hospitals I'm affiliated with. So that's basically me. Now, the summary, the aims and objectives of the talk this afternoon is going to be this. First one is what parents need to know. Number two, how concerning is Omicron for kids? Number three, the list of vaccinations that are available for kids globally. Number four, how to manage and treat cold-like symptoms and that's symptoms of Omicron in children, and how to protect the most vulnerable in our society. So this will be the aims and objectives, and I'm gonna give a summary as well, because this talk is going to involve healthcare professionals and frontline workers. 
because I think we need to get a better understanding of actually what that we're dealing with. Now, what do we know about Omicron? Now I put Delta and Omicron on the left and right side. As you can see here, the genomic sequence is here. B.1 is 617.2 is Delta and B.1.1 is 529 is Omicron. I always wonder whether this is the IP address of where this virus is actually born. The reason is because if you look at B1617.2, the place of birth was Wuhan, China, that we all know. And if you look at Omicron, the place of birth was South Africa, which is basically looks like another IP address. And I call the Delta the hero of the first and second waves. Now, Omicron is the hero of the third wave. So there has to be a hero in every wave. And we are the people who ride on these waves and get over it. So if you've got past one and two, you're lucky. If you're still watching this in third wave, you're a hero. And if we manage to go to the fourth wave, you're Spartacus. And if we manage to go to the fifth wave, then I think we're all done. So we don't really know how many waves that we're going to see because there's so many serves that are going to happen and so many surges that, they're going to, that is going to happen. Now, if you ask common people, everyone knows that Delta basically wiped off a large number of a society of people with poor old age and who also had comorbidities. And unfortunately, we didn't have vaccines at that point of time. Now, when the second wave come, a lot of people didn't believe in vaccinations. And even today, when I looked at the newspaper, there was one lady from the Czech Republic where both a husband and a son got vaccinated and she didn't believe in vaccination. So basically she sent and she went to the government and said, both my family members are vaccinated. Why should I not get vaccinated? Because I'm hoping to get natural immunity. But she succumbed to the Omicron virus for the very simple reason that basic problem is she did not believe in vaccination. That's basically how we're going to prevent the further surges that are going to come on in the next few months time. Now, the question is, how bad is Omicron? Now, look at these slides here. These are slides from newspapers which have come recently. Now, on the left side, you can see that there are two slides from the Gauteng province in Johannesburg and Pretoria in South Africa, where this was born. And you can see that the early surge of Omicron is on the left side. The red line clearly indicates there's a huge and a massive spike from the start of the wave. And we saw a big spike on day 10 in the Omicron, whereas in the Delta wave, you can see that the spike actually happened about 50 days or perhaps 60 days. And that's basically where we are with the infections. Now, this is how you count the wave, as you can see the pattern here, but it goes up and essentially it comes down. The other issue is that we are seeing a lot of children with colds, coughs, runny nose, upper respiratory tract infection symptoms now. And you wonder whether these are all symptoms of Omicron. Well, the answer is possibly yes. We don't know yet, but it may still be the Omicron. And if you look at Tamil Nadu, we have an interesting story about Omicron as well. Our health minister has said that if you test RT-PCR positive, we are not going to actually analyze whether you're actually Omicron positive or not. The reason is because by the time the result comes back, the Omicron basically gets out of your body or you're symptomatically better. Well, the negative news is that you won't know whether you had Omicron, but if your RT-PCR is positive, the good news is if it is Omicron, you're going to get better soon. And that's basically the best part of it. So fingers crossed, I hope it stays this way. Now, the slide on the right side, if you look at the first wave, second wave, and the third wave, some countries have actually shown a much huge spike in the first few days of Omicron itself, which is what the red line actually indicates. Now then, so the question is, yes, of course, we're seeing a surge, but how much should I be worried as a pediatrician or a healthcare professional? Now, the first thing, what do parents need to know? We understood that the immune response for Delta variant for the COVID virus was robust in children because a lot of them actually did not get the infection. We understood that Omicron was possibly going to hit children, but we didn't know how hard it was going to hit. So everyone was predicting a third wave come. We need to also understand why did these children not respond to the Delta variant? Because we know that the AC receptors are not as responsive as the adults. And a lot of children, even with comorbidities, had a very, very mild illness. So the question is, when it comes to Omicron virus, the experts started feeling that the response is not the same in kids as it was for the Delta variant. 
So when you see this, now we need to put data together. The difficulty we have in the first wave and second wave, there was a lot of you know, correlation and data collection was very robust. The reason is the government put together and told us who's got RTP positive and whether they need isolation and whatnot. But what we actually found in this third wave particularly, that there are a lot of children who test positive RT-PCR, but then we assume those are all due to Omicron in inverted commas. The pace of the spread, what I notice is very fast. The reason why I say that a lot of kids who get affected by Omicron is because this is basically some anecdotal and sporadic evidence. The reason is we don't really know what is the number, but my colleagues all over the country do tell us that these children are RT-PCR positive, but the reassuring part everyone tells us is the illness is very mild. So that's how promising it looks like at the moment. So parents who are watching it or healthcare professional frontline workers who are watching it, who have children, please understand that this is going to be a mild illness for the time being as we speak on the 20th of um, January, 2022. Right, how concerning is Omicron for kids? Now, this is where there's a bit of a fox now, what we need to understand is in this Fox course, there were six of seven kids who died of COVID in Delhi from the dates January 9 to 12 who had comorbidities. Now, the problem is these cases, basically, the health minister of Delhi basically came out with a statement saying that all these children have comorbidities or had comorbidities. Now, when you look at the data closely, we need to try and understand what are the comorbidities. Now, the first comorbidity was a heart condition. They didn't tell us what the heart condition was. The second condition was thalassemia major. The third condition was liver disease. The fourth one was extra pulmonary tuberculosis. But these are some of these things that we know of. What we don't know is what other comorbidity. Does it affect all children with comorbidities? Does it affect children with diabetes? Does it affect children with you know, any other issues that we don't really understand? But the particular group of children who are very, very likely to pick up an infection are children who are on immunosuppressions or who are on immunomodulators. And that's the reason why we have to mention that specifically, because there is no question that is out of the box and anything that is considered as a comorbidity must always be told to the parents. Okay, now let's look at how to protect the children. Now we understand that vaccinations are available globally but it is only approved for 15 to 18 years in India. Well, categorically speaking, we can call them as 15 to 17 years because if you're 18, you can actually have COVID shield. Now, between the age of 15 to 17, what are the vaccinations that are available? Interestingly, if you look back, the first vaccination that got emergency approval was Zydus Cadillus, Zycovd. Now, this got approved on the first, sorry, 20th of August, it was the first approved vaccine, but then till date, it's not commercially available. But Bharat Biotech actually got it first because they did a study in Nagpur and basically they found out that the immune response was actually excellent in all the age groups from two to 18 years. The government decided to prioritize the vaccinations for 15 to 17 years because it was affecting their higher secondary education quite badly and hence the reason why Covaxin was approved with two doses and weeks gap in between. The pending approval for vaccinations are Serum Institute Covax, Biological Ease, RBD, Johnson & Johnson, and the ag 26 b2 s vaccine, and also the Pfizer's BioNTech vaccine is there. When you look at the global data, Switzerland actually approved both Pfizer and Moderna vaccine for the age groups of 12 to 15 years, and Italy has also endorsed the use of Moderna at the age of 12 to 17. China's Sinopharm and Sinovac vaccines basically have not shown a very good immune response in children but they're still being used in China. And Cuba has actually got two homegrown vaccines. Like our own Covaxin, they have their vaccines called Abdallah and Soberena, and these vaccines are being used in Cuba. And if you look at other South American countries, countries such as uh, Venezuela are actually endorsing the same and have started using the Abdallah and Soberena. Okay, now symptoms that have come in kids that have come to light is what we are trying to explain here. The CDC basically said that 672 children on an average were admitted to hospitals every day with COVID-19 during the past one week. So that's basically a very gross estimate. They say that there were 672 children with COVID symptoms. 
that's basically one. So in a nutshell, if you ask me what were the symptoms, the symptoms are basically upper respiratory tract infection, or in other words, we'll just call it as a common cold. So the symptoms per se are basically a runny nose, persistent sneezing, sore throat, headache, cough, and myalgia. So these were the symptoms that were seen in these children who were admitted in the US in the last one week's time. Now, one other thing I have to say is a lot of children who have actually had Omicron have croup. And this is basically an anecdotal experience which I wanted to share. When I talk to colleagues, basically I can see that there are a lot of people who actually say that they've seen or recently started seeing an increase in the children who have croup. So I put in a picture of a child coughing who basically has got croup, which we understand is basically upper airway obstruction. A lot of these children basically have a tightness in the throat with a choking sensation. And I've seen some children coming with these as well. So croup, if you see a child with croup and fever, think about Omicron and that is the possibility. So the question comes, how to manage and treat cold-like symptoms of Omicron in children? Now, the logic is very simple. You treat them with hydration, make sure the topical and symptomatic treatments actually work, fever treated with paracetamol and NSAID if needed. And if not sure, please get checked with your pediatrician. And usually they get better within 48 hours to maximum 72 hours. So every time when we see a season of fever and full of infections, last month was practically a lot of dengue fevers. We got over it, we got Omicron, and now we're dealing with purely Omicron and majority of them are not getting tested, which is the sad part. So how to protect the most vulnerable children or the most vulnerable group in our society? Well, I've actually put the four C's, which is very important. I've written CAP, which is COVID associated behavior, which I don't have to tell you anymore because gloves, mask, sanitization, and face guard are multiple things that can be used in protection of yourselves. And that's basically why the four C's come. COVID associated behavior can only control COVID is what I've said here, the four C's of the management of COVID. So in summary, I wanted to highlight a few points because there are some major things that completely get missed because everyone starts thinking about Omicron, Omicron, Omicron. People forget the basics. They don't understand that identification of a sick child is the most important thing one should understand. The first must know is in children, RT-PCR can be negative in the early days of illness. That is extremely important. So a negative RT-PCR should not make you get carried away because in, if it is negative and if you keep testing it again, say maybe another 48 hours apart, and if it turns out to be positive, then you know the answer. But at the same time, if the child has got a COVID PCR which is negative on say a couple of occasions, then you need to start thinking about other causes which is extremely important and that's what I'm trying to tell you here. The next must know is stick to the basics. The most important thing is comfortable clothing, sponging and hydration. I see a lot of children, it's quite a natural temptation for parents when the child complains of rigors to put in on a lot of clothing and increase the layering. And that basically is assumed the thought to actually stop them from actually shaking, which in fact actually makes things worse because it increases the core temperature. Third point, paracetamol and ibuprofen or mephenamic acid are medicines used in children for bringing the fever down. Now, there's a lot of, um, I would say, controversy or debate about pediatricians advising don't use ibuprofen and don't use mephenamic acid. I'm quite comfortable as a pediatric gastroenterologist because any drug such as paracetamol may by itself can cause problems. You don't have to think as far as using ibuprofen or mephenamic acid because those can actually cause side effects as well. But we need to understand the side effects are only in rare conditions. And most of the time, children tolerate it very well. Okay, the next must-know point is anti-allergic medicines as prescribed should be regularly given. Now, the question is, what anti-allergic medicines do we give, sir? So if you talk about medicines like fexofenadine, you're talking about chlorphenamine, you talk about any medicine that is used for cold and cough, those medicines can be actually used in the management and must be given to ensure that the child actually gets symptomatic treatment and is symptomatic better. And this is something, the most important thing, the last but not the least, is to know the warning signs when a fever may need hospitalization. 
So here you can see that all fevers do not need hospitalization, but there are some fevers that will need hospitalization. So I'm going to point out the warning signs, and this is basically where we are. So the last but not the least must know is basically when a fever may need hospitalization. The first point is when the child is extremely lethargic, drowsy, or the child has got excessive crying or irritation. This also tells you this may not be Omicron and could be something else. Headache, neck stiffness, or breathing difficulty would be another sign to concern about. Abnormal movements or behavior in the child, which basically what we're trying to understand is if this child is septicemic or if the child has got meningitis, the child is going to have abnormal body movements or behavior. The fourth point is the temperature persistently removing, sorry, uh, behaving or remaining above 104 is extremely important. We need to understand that that's not a good sign either. The last sign here is fever that is persisting for more than five days, because if it is more than five days, you need to understand there are other causes, and that may also include conditions which may happen during COVID time as well, such as multi-inflammatory syndrome in children, and also this could be caused like a disease or it could be any other condition out of the box. And that is the reason why we would say don't start or don't getting don't do not worry if the child is getting better in 48 hours but if the temperature is persistent and if it's more than five days that's certainly a sign to be concerned about so that's basically my take on omicron and how we should manage it better and as i said before it's very very important that we understand what is omicron and why it is different from delta and when we should start worrying about it and why we should not be worrying about it now i'm going to hand over the session back to the moderator and we'll catch up towards the end when we have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for uh, giving the practical approach and uh, about the clinical management by approaching the patient and not panicking. So we do have some question which we'll uh, address at the end of the session, near the end of the session. Uh, so now uh, it's my honor to uh, welcome Dr. Vasan. Uh, Dr. Vasan Kumar, sir, is uh, a consultant in pediatric intensive care unit at Apollo Hospital, Chennai, and uh, he handles the ECMO unit and also done the fellowship in the same. Uh, he is an excellent teacher, uh, most approachable, and every year reinforces and refreshes our uh, intensive care knowledge by Apollo Clinics. Uh, also, uh, he has uh, published many papers for uh, the cardiopulmonary interaction and ECMO. Uh, well, he has also uh, many chapters and international uh, publications to his credit. So he will be throwing some more light uh, in the present Omicron situation. Over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. In, uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Sure. So I'll just start uh, sharing my screen. So Dr. Dhanashekar had uh, told you about how to manage the kids, how they present, how to manage them in the outpatient department. And once they come to the hospitalized care or once they enter into the ICU, I'll be telling you, I'll just give you a practical approach of how to manage children once they reach the hospital, when do you admit them, and what are all the basic things which you do in your ICU. So like we have seen so many variants, the variants are labeled as alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and we've reached the stage of Omicron now. And uh, there are some more numericals left, like pi, rho, sigma. We don't know what all is left till omega. I hope we don't reach that stage. So we are in the stage of uh, Omicron right now. And uh, this has been discussed earlier. And uh, as a part of preparation, like for the third wave, uh, which was like for the Delta variant, initially thought like the adults are already like uh, exposed and the children are the ones who are not vaccinated. So we had uh, we have a simulation center where we have... Uh, Organize a lot of uh, preparation for the doctors and the paramedical person. Around 390 doctors and nurses have been trained in our uh, uh, center for the basic uh, airway and the basic life support and uh, little bit details about the COVID and uh, their complications. So I'll be the introduction is already over. So I'll be giving an introduction with some brief uh, case and presentations and how to admit them and how do you transport them, what care you take for them and how will you manage them. All just your uh, superficial overview of things. 
So the usual presentation, uh, in addition to what Dr. Dhanesh Shekhar had mentioned, will be like for a hospitalization, will be like persistent fever, and especially if they have some cough and fast breathing. So that fast breathing is a, a danger sign, which you'll be worried. And usually these patients will generally be in assessed, and then we have dedicated fever clinics now in the each hospital. So in our hospital, I'll be just telling you what we do in our hospital. So we have a dedicated fever clinic. So once we suspect COVID, we take a call whether we should admit or not. So that is the call which we take. The second form of presentation will be when they get incidentally admitted. You admit a kid for some other reason and they turn out to be COVID positive. And these are, for so Omicron, if you see, the fever is not a very common symptom. What they've told is like only 30, 40% only has fever and majority is like running nose, headache, fatigue and sore throat and body pains. So these are uh, more common than fever. So the absence of fever does not rule Omicron. So once you feel that the kid may need hospital admission because of persistent fever or some fast breathing or some danger signs which has already been told, you decide whether to admit in the ward or uh, ICU. Before that, once you suspect, you will give a swab for COVID. So we will wait for the results of COVID. So one is asymptomatic presentation. Other can be mild presentation, which we usually call as upper respiratory infection, like cough, cold. The moderate presentation will be like a pneumonia, just fast breathing or saturation low. So that is a moderate uh, severity. And the severe one will be like anything above that, any respiratory distress or any shock or any child needing ventilator. So mild, moderate and severe. So I'll be discussing about the moderate and the severe ones, which usually requires intensive care uh, management. So before that, once you're suspected, you've sent a sample for uh, testing. So to identify Omicron, there is a specific variant. There are different antigens which are available. So if you identify the S gene is not there, that means it fits into Omicron. If the S gene is present, it fits into the Delta variant. And as already discussed, a negative test does not mean the child does not have COVID virus. Because if you strongly suspect, it is ideal to repeat a sample after 48 hours. Or instead of a nasal swab, if your child is very sick or non-intubated or all, you can even send a tracheal aspirate. So this is the slide which will tell you, suppose you have a nasal swab, it is only 63% positive, sputum is only 70%, but a tracheal aspirate will give you higher percentage. So you are likely to miss around one third of the patients if you rely only on PCR analysis. So clinical suspicion is the key. So when you suspect strongly, keep them isolated, even if the child is a sample negative. So when do you admit a kid in ICU? So as I said, if the child has pneumonia, which is category V, or if the child is having severe pneumonia, or other presentations like ARDS, septic shock, the child is ending up in altered sensory. So we've decided that we are going to admit this child because this child has whatever the index case has fever, cough, and fast breathing. So fast breathing becomes an indication for admission. We are here, we admit an ICU. So how do we do it from here? ER to your uh, or your fever clinic to the ICU. Suppose in our ward, the ER is in the ground floor and the ICU is in the first floor. First, what do we do? We call the ICU and ask if there is bed not in the PSU and the COVID ICU. We have a dedicated space where it is available or not. So once it is available, we keep an alert that is called green corridor. Where we inform that uh, in the entire route of transfer, there is no, no one intrudes when the child is being transferred from the emergency to the and we have a separate lift. Basically, it is all zonalized. So we have a COVID zone, which has a separate lift, which takes care of only COVID patients, nothing else. And during the transport also, ensure the baby can be masked also. So children above five years, they have a symptomatic, it is better to keep them masked. So the staff who take care of the transport also should be masked, So which is very important. So how is COVID care different from the other routine care? The ICU structure itself is different. So you need ideally a negative pressure room. So which means the virus which is inside, you don't want it to go outside and cause spreading to other people. But that may not be possible in most of the cases, HEPA filter and all. So we use an exhaust fan. So we have one negative pressure room. The other room is like predominantly exhaust fan, which will just uh, uh, do this work of negative pressure. And manpower constraints, because most of your healthcare workers are also getting infected with COVID. So that is a constraint which we face. And we ensure that all the doctors also have to wear full PPE. So compared to the previous like 2020 start, where we used to have all those uh, jumpsuits and uh, face shield and uh, shoe cover, like we couldn't even recognize who is 
whether it's a doctor or a nurse or a attender now we have the restricted to four things which is must to prevent covid spread if you wear this even if you take care of a covid patient you will not get infected so that is a cap a mask n95 mask a gown and gloves so these are the four things which are required so other differences between covid care and usual care will be, as i said it is zonalized we have a separate zone ppe is important and many times there are some problems are like some of the instructions which are told may not be very clearly audible because it used to be happening much earlier now it has all come down and uh, whatever help if you need see this is zonalized no so there will be limited number of people who takes care and nurses are the key so what we do as doctors is we just go there do rounds and we come back but nurses are the ones who really take care of the indian medicines we get things ready but for them to do it usually takes little time because of the limited uh, manpower availability all those procedures also because what happens is if we take something into a covid room that is generally not taken back in case we don't need to use it so these are some of the hurdles which we face when we manage a covid uh, patient inside the covid ward or the covid ic so as we see more and more babies and as we get more used to it the situation is getting better now and investigations also once you come positive there are some battery of investigations it is not necessary that you have to do all so the one on the left are definitely has to be done like cbc ctp cd number and x ray mandatory if you have respiratory symptom all these investigations like ferritin ldh triglycerides these are all optional and most importantly is don't end up going ct scan routinely for all patients so once you have a positive report the ct scan for children it is predominantly asymptomatic or mild disease even if you have a moderate or a severe disease it is not going to help or give you any additional information so there is no need to do routine ct scan this i would like to emphasize and in our icu as healthcare workers we have to be ready to protect ourselves so for that i said four important things in ppe which you have to wear in addition to it there are some procedures which are likely to spread the virus at a higher degree the amount of virus spread at this procedures or at this point of time is likely to be more so at those point of time we we'll have to be even more careful and limit the number of people available in the tent so which is like intubation extubation physiotherapy by doing physiotherapy it is a risk of aerosol generating these are all called aerosol generating procedures where the likelihood of faster spread of the virus is there and burst of viruses are likely to get released nebulization so we have literally stopped using nebulization and we resort to giving uh, only mda during the time of covid uh, epidemics especially right now so high flow of oxygen et suctioning and bag and mask ventilation so suppose uh, some of the procedures i thought i'll just highlight you here so here this is a simulation which i mean photograph of some simulation where you want to intubate so the aim is you don't want the doctor who is intubating this patient to come as close to the patient as possible so there is a barrier so we have something called uh, this barrier has been put here uh, glass uh, sort of thing so through which there is a hole here the intubator intubates the patient through this and the other person connects helps in connecting the uh, to the circuit subsequently so this one is called a filter so you don't want the contaminated uh, viral load to get exposed to the atmosphere so you have a filter which is connected to the ventilator circuit so that the expired air which goes out goes out without any much of viral particles so this preparation is very important and always in children remember that children have to be intubated with a cuffed endotracheal tube so you have a impression that uh, intubation for children doesn't need a cuff it has to be always with a cuffed endotracheal tube and the experienced person intubates obviously in children covid intubation is going to be very very rare i mean but uh, even if it's a one intubation you have to face the expert has to be ideally available at the point of time and uh, these are the precautions you have to follow so ensure yourself because it is a aerosol generating procedure you be more careful at the point of time use a cuff to tube and have a filter along with you available and one more don't which you have to remember is don't keep bagging the patient often so that is again will increase the risk of spread of the virus and once you have intubated don't disconnect reconnect these things don't do and avoid unnecessary suctioning so these are the things which is important to safeguard yourself from the virus because we as caretakers should first always ensure that we are safe so that we can take care of even more uh, sicker patients once they come so these are the things which i already mentioned care of mentally ill patient 
and routine i see what we do is in rounds what we do is predominantly it is nurse driven nurses are the ones who monitor and give us important inputs and our uh, rounds happen like we go once in the morning and once in the evening remaining it is all predominantly by the nursing staff who take care of everything and the counseling of attenders and other things are done by video calls even sometimes we get video calls when we ask the nurse to show us video call and we assess the patient sometimes even uh, through the video call so this is some of the things which we have done during this covid period and always important remember that when the baby is like tachypneic requiring oxygen it is like adults are told to prone same way the pediatric babies also can be uh, done prone especially for adolescents they'll cooperate you can ask them to prone themselves so lie in a prone position or if not if they are sick and ventilated again this proning is going to be helpful because when we lie so fine the dependent areas of the lungs gets affected more so if we keep them in prone position like tummy side uh, it will help in improving the oxygenation so that is found to be a very useful uh, therapy which helps in covid 19 and always remember even in situations of cardiac arrest always there is no emergency in covid 19 just remember that you first wear your ppe first and after that you go inside so the remaining steps of cardiac arrest will remain the same especially but remember then just while bagging ensure that you have an adequate seal while you bag the patient and always use a cuffed ET tube so these are the things and ensure that there is a cardiac arrest even if it is there you wear safeguard yourself first don ppe and after that enter the zone similarly even during extubation it is a aerosol generating procedure as i listed what all the things and uh, you will have to ensure that limited people are available at the point of time and try to extubation to face mask and whenever you give oxygen ensure that you give the least amount of oxygen which will keep the saturation in the normal limits so thereby more higher the flow higher the risk of viral spread so limit the oxygen levels to the lowest possible levels so this is the uh, setup and what precautions you need to do and what we do in our routine uh, hospital and icu for covid patients so what medications do we give so a lot of medications like the research is ongoing this are like like there are four or five medicines which i have listed there are multiple number of drugs which are in the pipeline some work some not work so we'll see uh, what usually is given so before you select a drug there are few things which you have to see is it really covid or not and does it need admission so if it is covid and it does not need admission children do not need any medicine at all it is just like your paracetamol and uh, whatever anti allergic medicines and some cough suppressants and cough syrups are the ones which as such is needed so for opd patients if the child is not getting admitted the child does not need any medicine at all for a hospitalized patient it is our role to select what drug whether the child is in the hospital or in the icu it depends on what day of illness or what day of testing i mean day of illness because some works antivirals works only within the first 7 days so it is important to know that and what severity of the condition it is and what are the comorbidities since it is an evolving evidence it is always important to take informed consent before you put with the parents so that you uh, you know the what evidence you are dealing with because the, the drug which works now may not work in the future so it is important to tell them all those pros and cons and before you give any medicine and if you have a infectious disease expert available you can take their opinion also so option if you see is like any child just remember if it is needing oxygen you have to give steroids flexin remdesivir has a doubtful role some people give some people do not give but steroids and flexin is definitely required if any child requiring oxygen just start dexamethasone and flexin suppose the child is on nine you or you intubate the child or the child is very sick in addition to this you have to consider tocilizumab which is il6 inhibitor and recently this monoclonal antibodies have also come into the picture now an alternative for tocilizumab is there which is called baricitinib so and because there is a severe disease always you end up giving antibiotics also but remember do not give antibiotics for a child who is covid positive sitting at home please avoid and even for moderate disease when you have a covid positive like just pneumonia it is covid pneumonia don't give antibiotics but for very severe disease was intubated ard as well you can consider there may be a possibility of secondary infection so dexamethasone is the key steroids are mainstay but do not overuse steroids admitted patient pneumonia give steroids So dexamethasone is a start, but you can even give oral prednisone, but do not give for outpatient. The dose is this. Usually it varies from five days to ten days is the thing, and we usually give up and give the dose in the morning. The reason why I am mentioning is sometimes if the child 
we try when the child gets admitted we want to discharge them home as early as possible so we give the dose in the morning and once the child is stable the like cafe 3 4 days we can get the uh, baby discharged so that we have a bed available for next patient when it is needed so heparin again as i said is like 1 mg per kg you just see the deep dimer levels if it is more than 5 times so we'll just give heparin at 1 mg per kg for moderate to severe fever and remdesivir it is does not have any mortality benefit and all you can give if the child has during the viremia phase like 7 to 10 days of hospital within of the onset of illness uh, just needing oxygen so oxygen need for a child dexamethasone heparin plus minus remdesivir but for severe children remdesivir does not have a role and these are the doses <coughs> which have been mentioned excuse <coughs> me so if the child has liver dysfunction or liver failure you are supposed to not give remdesivir and in case you give remdesivir monitor the lft every alternate day and this is another drug il6 inhibitor which has to be given when you have a severe patient who is critically ill on ventilator support along with your dexamethasone so the dose is 8 mg per kg and if you have this is a immune suppression so basically the problem with covid is hyperimmunity so we are trying to suppress the hyperimmunity first by steroids the steroid does not work you end up giving il6 inhibitor which will again crash the immunity so if you have a super infection like a bacterial infection you are not supposed to give this tocilizumab so the procalcitonin is an important marker which will help you identify this this baricitinib is an alternative to tocilizumab it is just coming up now it is a oral medicine so again for sick patients very sick ones you can give this it is available as a oral or ng root you can give 4 mg it has to be modified again if you have strong infections as patient like secondary infection you do not give this and this is a monoclonal antibody if you see in adults it's been commonly prescribed for especially adults 60 plus who have comorbidities you can take this what they say is if you give this combination of antibody it prevents the opd patients from getting admitted to the hospital an extrapolation of this is like for children who or adults who get admitted in our in the hospital who are very critically ill they prevent it from progressing further suppose your child is on oxygen or so they do not get intubated so that sort of uh, benefit it gives but the point to note it it is beneficial only for variants other than omicron so for omicron it is not benefited it is only beneficial for the delta variant but uh, this doesn't matter because i think omicron is predominantly uh, whatever Uh, case reports which are the case series which i have seen is a milder form of infection so probably you will uh, not require a severe you will not end up having a severe form of illness so again remember this to give this monoclonal antibody the patient should be antibody negative so the patient already has antibody there is no use giving monoclonal antibody so the child should be like within presenting within 7 days of the symptom onset and should be antibody negative and it should not be omicron strain then you can give this and always remember that this is like around 1200 mg a day so you can even share like give half well for the child and you can give the remaining to another person who benefits us. because this drug costs close to like 1.2 lakhs so other things this is the most important slide so more than what has to be given the thousand people will tell you what has to be given what not this like do not give steroids for opd patients which is very very important don't abuse steroids do not give zinc do not give multivitamin you can just give just like that but it does not have any role no role of vitamin c please stop giving hcq if you are giving there is no role for plasma unless it is used for trials so stick no to any of these there are many people or many calls which we get for asking for plasma i don't know why people still keep doing plasma now so over treatment is very important just that we have a lot of medicines remember that this is a viral infection so antiviral is generally have not much role we are trying to act on the inflammation part of the virus by suppressing it with steroids and other second line medicines so if you over treat it you give too much of steroids new new fungus like black fungus will come subsequently if you abuse this time you will end up getting lot of unknown funguses later on so which for which we'll have to wait and see so if we act smart now we can prevent uh, subsequent uh, new fungus and other organism flaring up so how long will i isolate my child if the child is like at home like having like mild symptoms 7 days is ideal for moderate patients in hospital we keep 
provided the child has to be afebrile at the seventh day and not much symptoms. And for moderate symptoms, it's usually like 10 days. And for severe ones, we usually keep it isolated for 20 days and subsequently then keep them shifted to the ICU. And uh, suppose you have a COVID positive patient and antibody is also positive. So that means the patient already has antibody and you need not isolate them. Because this PCR can be positive for a lot of days, even 60, 90 days it can be positive. And after the isolation, this common question, you need not repeat a test at seventh day or eighth day to say that you're COVID negative. Because the false positive, I mean, dead virus can also be seen for a longer duration of time. So no need to repeat the test at the end of your isolation period. So this is the dark mode, which is COVID Omicron. Uh, I would like to go to a brighter mode. I mean, not exactly a brighter mode. It is actually the darkest form, actually, if you see, which is MASE, which happens a little later after COVID uh, virus infection, usually like four to six weeks after COVID infection, you get something called MASE, which is more common in children. Multisystem being implemented. Disease. Suppose where you have fever and uh, three, four days fever, like and elevated markers, especially if the CRP is in triple digits, you strongly suspect this MASE and you roll out other causes, there is no bacterial infection, and you do a COVID antibody test. If the COVID antibody test comes positive, it becomes MASE. And because antibody is formed already, you do not require isolation at this point of time. It can be in a milder form like febrile inflammatory, it can have a Kawasaki like presentation. Or it can have shock like or multi system involvement, where two or more organs are involved. So, again, this is hyperinflammation. So, your job is like immunomodulation. So, for milder form, you just give no treatment, or if it persists, you can give a oral steroid at this point at one milligram per kg. If it is Kawasaki disease, like you would do like Kawasaki, like usual presentation, give IVAG and aspirin. For multi system, again, steroids will do. If it is in shock, you consider IV MPS, methyl prednisolone, at 10 to 30 milligram per kg. Even most of the time, at one dose itself, they improve. Subsequently, you can switch to oral steroids. So, this is about uh, pediatric COVID and MASU. So, what I would like to highlight or summarize at this point of time is remember, Omicron is the number of people who are getting affected may be more, but uh, the severity uh, till now definitely seems to be much less there. So, we hope that. Because pediatric children, are not, I mean, especially like the vaccine is now available only to 15 to 18. So younger children may get affected, but they will predominantly have only milder form of symptoms. So that is, in fact, uh, the more people get infected, there is a chance that herd immunity may also develop. But uh, the number of kids who reach the severe ones on the ICU are going to be much lesser. So that is what is the thought process right now. But that shouldn't stop you from keeping yourself prepared. So it is better to have a preparation, even for non-pediatricians, it is better to be aware of what is going to happen in pediatric COVID and what is MASC. It is better to be prepared. And uh, finally, about the medications, uh, it is like, don't abuse steroids. Use medications based on whatever is indicated. Like, get help from others. Like, uh, just like that, do not give uh, medications over the counter. And keep yourself uh, protected also where appropriate uh, personal protective equipment, especially uh, N95 masks and uh, when you handle uh, COVID positive patients. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so right from OPD management to inpatient management, uh, we have covered most of the topics, but uh, now we do have uh, some of the questions coming up from uh, the audience who have attended. So uh, I would like to ask, like, uh, so what is uh, the right age for vaccination for children and how many doses should be given and what should be the basic interval? This is a question from Dr. Ravindra Manohar. So I think uh, uh, Dr. Vasant can take that. What is the right age for vaccination? That's right. Means uh, how, uh, which is the earliest age when we can vaccinate a child with the uh, COVID vaccine, and what should be the interval between the two doses? No, but uh, now we have to just follow the government regulations, right? Whatever we decide as the right age, I think doesn't really matter. I think whatever the whenever the government says, like the children are like allowed yeah, I'll, to. I'll actually, I think, uh, I'll actually, I'll answer the question, Vasan. So basically, what we have done is actually, sir, can tell us because the study was done in Nagpur with Covaxin. Sir, is that right? You started doing this coaxin study in Nagpur in the last six months' time. And basically, they vaccinated children from about the age of two years up to the age of 18 years. And what they found is basically the immune response is categorically good in all these age groups. So if you treat them in three clusters, so basically two to five, five to 10, and 10 to 15, and basically the response is actually good overall. One. 
Now we have approval for 15 to 17 years already because as I said before, 18 years, they can have COVID shield. Now what happens is for children, again, now the vaccination age group has been reduced. From March, it'll be 12 to 14 years who get vaccinated. So what the government is basically, basically proposing is this proposal is already out for 12 to 14 years. And basically we will be getting vaccinations quite soon for other age groups as well. So this is basically how it's going to work. As of now in India, 15 and above are the only ones who can get vaccinated. And anyone less than the age of 15 will have to wait till March. And if you're 12 to 14 years, you're fine. And after that, it'll just roll out after that. So in continuation to that, uh, we would like to also ask that what is the role of influenza vaccine? Influenza vaccine, which has been given in and out these days. Uh, I can give a perspective from general pediatrics and from a gastro point of view, and then I'll ask person to answer the question. Now, influenza vaccine, certainly yes, because I think what we need to understand, which is what I told you in my talk is, all that glitters is not gold and all that is fever and basically upper respiratory symptoms is not Omicron. We need to still understand when you actually try and find one cause for a particular problem, we tend to forget all the things. In December, I saw nearly close to 190 cases of dengue fever. And that's basically an outpatient management I'm talking about. So if I was to think all of them to actually have COVID, these 190 children could have been easily missed. That's one thing. And the second thing is basically if you had not done an RT-PCR or a RAT test, and we could have just easily lost them as well. The same thing applies. So if you actually treat or forget the older infections, H1N1 can still have a resurgence and these infections can actually come back. But although we still see very, very less cases of H1N1, H1N2, I think we should still vaccinate them, particularly for children from the age group of six months, because those children are very late likely to get the COVID vaccine. So I think, of course, the big green flag for me for giving them the influenza vaccine, exactly as per the IAP recommendation. Vasan, sir, would you like to add something? No, I think there is, uh, I mean, no question at all that uh, you have to, I mean, you definitely have to give your influenza vaccine. You, like you are already suffering from, influenza is actually a much dreaded disease than uh, COVID for children. So there are a lot of sicker patients which you have had with severe influenza infection. So I think uh, that becomes much of a priority than COVID as such. Sure. So uh, we also have that as a general physician, we need to update in latest line of management in younger age group. So I think most of this has already been covered, that line of management in younger age group in the slides already. So I think uh, we, can, we can just uh, skip this question. And uh, how can we suspect a case of Omicron variety of COVID? Uh, this is the question of Dr. Chakravarti, sir. So I think this is also covered, but... If yeah, I did that, actually. I did in my yeah. talk. I said, by the time the results come back as Omicron, the patient is better. So I in see. Tamil Nadu, we have stopped doing actually Omicron gene sequencing. Sure. Uh, Vasan, sir, a question to you. Uh, will Omicron respond to 2DG? And is 2DG worth uh, using? No, I don't think... Uh, that's what I said. No, we should... Uh, see, children are going to have only minor symptoms or predominantly remain asymptomatic, I think we should not rather end up trying all these medicines. We really don't know what this medicine is going to cause problem for us in the future. So when the disease as such is going to be mild and not cause much problem, why explore new options uh, just that you have uh, something uh, coming up right now? Children should never made, uh, be made guinea pigs because that's one thing people get tempted. Throw everything at them, basically like gems. Each one, catch one. Get 2DG, take Temdesivir, take steroids. Basically, it creates more trouble than anything else. So we have a lot of pediatricians uh, who are viewing this and uh, we have a lot of uh, question of vaccination again. So, uh, yes, I just, uh, a question to you again. Pfizer vaccine trials for kids under five. Why there are so many negative results and why there is so much of delay? I think this is going to be a politically biased answer. I don't think we should stop talking about Pfizer, Modern and all that because that's never going to come to India. There are a lot of logistical reasons because of storage and you know whatever. So I think Indian vaccines for Indian children and this is again not going to be politically supporting. We have seen some good efficacy, especially the results are from your area. So I think we should stick on to that. Pfizer is never going to come to India and I don't see Moderna coming to India either. So the negative impact does not impact me at all. Absolutely. I have given my children for vaccine. Right. And so what is the role of nasal vaccine? Nasal vaccine in pediatric age group, since we know that uh, the nasal receptors are not so much. Uh, so is there a role of nasal vaccine in pediatric age group, especially? 
So in anecdotal history, basically, if you look at all the vaccines, I might be very naive and very cut to the point. If you look at any vaccine in pediatrics, I mean, you're, you're very experienced, you know better. You've tried oral typhoid, it doesn't work. We know injectable polio is efficacious than oral polio, not that oral polio does not work. Yes, of course. We already had an in, inhaled influenza vaccine that flopped. So practically all the vaccines have actually not worked, anything that is not given as an injection. So basically that is basically a blanket statement. And basically we see that nasal vaccines resurgence or coming back into real vogue is going to take a year or two years because our priority would be to actually give all in children injectable vaccines because we know they're very safe and then wait for things to change with time. So say in absence of research, uh, will it be uh, so effective, as effective as the injectable vaccines? That is the question. I don't know. I don't think it's going to be as effective as the injectable vaccine per se, because this is going to be also very difficult to administer a nasal vaccine to a child too. How much of it is going to go in? What is the bioavailability? What is the vaccine response? What is the antibody that is going to come? Everything is going to be a big challenge. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Wasn't sir, part of the following question has been uh, answered by Kesalu, sir, but uh, a question to you, what is uh, the presentation uh, of uh, children with COVID having sickle cell or thalassemia as comorbidities? So, how do they present? Oh, I, I mean, any child can rather uh, develop COVID. So, I think uh, child sickle also can develop COVID. And... Uh, the presentation, I mean, I've not seen much of a patient with uh, sickle cell, though I've seen some oncological patients who get the COVID positive. So what happens is they have symptoms of COVID like URI symptoms and sore throat fever is there. But uh, they do not have this MIAC like complications because some of the med med uh, they are rather they are immune, immune suppressed because of whatever medicines they get. So they do not develop much of this uh, MASC complications. Or even if they develop, they have little milder symptoms. So other than that, I think the symptomology probably remains the same. Right. So in continuation... I do not that, have much experience to it. Right, sir. So in continuation to that, uh, there's also a question that can Omicron cause MISC in newborn? Means what we are observing that uh, after Omicron, the cases of MISC have reduced significantly as compared to Delta. So the question here stays that Omicron uh, can cause MIC newborn. Is it so? I think we have to wait and see for uh, more babies. Or there is a there is a very popular saying in English called the hen's teeth. So that's basically what uh, newborn Omicron causing MISC. I think that will be a case report in Indian pediatrics very soon coming soon. Please keep watching. <laughs> that's all I can tell you. <laughs> Yes. Uh, Vasan, sir, again, a question directed to you. Uh, how is the anti uh, antibody titer after Omicron infection? I do not have idea. Right. Uh, Kisalu, sir, can you just uh, fill in? Well, we, we have seen good antibody response to the Delta infection. Without Omicron, we don't really know. I think what we really hoping that every day, because we're seeing so many fever cases, I think we're going to get herd immunity very soon. And everyone's going to have good antibiotic, antibody response. That's basically what I can really pray and hope for. We don't know statistics. Ask me about COVID statistics, basically zero. And especially, this is a very tough question for anybody to answer. So just that it's spreading fast and uh, behaving a little mild and asymptomatic, that is actually, in a way, good for us. I don't know, like, yeah. That's right. Uh, it's also a question uh, from Dr. Bhatt uh, from Delhi that uh, he has also done some research on GI symptoms seen in COVID-19 patient and got a prevalence of 21.5%. The most common symptom was anorexia followed by vomiting. Uh, so he's interested to know uh, the rate of GI symptoms in children, especially below 18 years, uh, specifically, which are more common in relation to COVID-19. Okay, with the Delta, what we saw was the most common presentation was actually diarrhea and vomiting. That was the primary symptom what they presented because other symptoms are quite vague, to be honest. Anorexia is quite a vague symptom. Fever is quite a vague symptom. Nausea is a very vague symptom. But diarrhea and vomiting was the most common symptoms in children with COVID. Globally, there have been a lot of case reports and case series where people have said that this is how it presents in children, especially with GI manifestation. Just one more point to add to it. Like even in MISC, like we have collected our data, it may not be much like 50 patients or 60 patients. The most common presenting symptom other than fever was the GI symptoms. Like abdominal pain, vomiting, nausea. Mm -hmm. So, 
in ga symptoms are the key just like dengue being a ga illness this also i think behaves more like a yeah ga illness. like the primary covid is like respiratory but the mase has come predominantly ga uh, so again the question that uh, uh, how to differentiate omicron and delta clinically i think uh, kesadu sir has already answered that uh what is the duration uh the child should wait for receiving his regular pediatric immunization post recovery from covid you want to take it muscles so you can take sir vaccination right, okay. case so vaccination basically is very straightforward if you had covid and you recovered normally we'd say 3 weeks post vaccination would be an ideal time just that we actually ex- expect if there was any complications in the inverted commas following covid you actually get it over in 21 days that could be in mis because that's one of the complications and basically giving some adequate time to give an antibody response and making sure the child recovers from it completely then you go for the vaccination perfectly after that i think 3 to 4 weeks would be very reasonable uh a sub question to that can uh, the regular vaccines be taken along with covid i think with the age group at present uh, it is not uh, feasible but uh, yes in case uh, the early age groups are opening up so can regular vaccines be taken with covid vaccines i would take it with a pinch of salt to be very honest with you because the reason is we don't really know how it's going to work all these studies that have been done inclusion into exclusion right if you look at it they basically have had only covid vaccines and have not had any subsequent vaccine administered at the same time as well so to be very honest as for safety precautions and reasons i would say give the covid vaccines take three weeks gap before and after any particular vaccination i think that'll be ideal wasan sir uh should we recommend monoclonal to every everyone in spite of guidelines saying it to be transgenic and with side effects i think no definitely no see uh, even in adults they give for like 60 plus or so with comorbidities so i think for children it is going to be asymptomatic again and again i keep telling it is for predominantly 90% or even 95% of the children are going to have just due or a or they even you even know don't know that they have had the covid so it is going to be that sort of thing asymptomatic here so i don't think we should uh, like like dr dhanashekar said we should not treat children like as guinea pigs <laughs> uh, and so what is the incidence of rise in autoimmune diseases post covid infection in children so can you repeat the question what is the uh, so incidence of rise of autoimmune diseases means have we observed any rise in autoimmune diseases in children post covid see when uh, rajamouli directed bahubali 1 and 2 he never said there was going to be a 3 so i think 3 or 4 we have to wait and see because it's an evolving phenomenon this is how exactly when i remember when i was a kid hiv was first diagnosed and people started asking questions and they never stopped asking questions we still talking about antiretroviral therapy hiv vaccine the list goes on i think auto antibody or an autoimmune disease itself in pediatrics is such a small cohort i think we should stop worrying at it and look at the bigger picture and offer vaccination all children sure sir uh, so i would like to ask that what are the neurological and psychological abnormalities uh, we find in pediatric patients post covid of course and uh, sub question to it i'll just add later i think covid has actually given more psychological problems before the infection we see children having lack of sleep obesity increased weight gain behavioral problems lack of speech speech delay psychiatric disturbances depression in the family aggression violence you can see my mouth never stops because i've seen so many of them now so post covid if you ask me about depression i think having covid around people for people around you itself is depressing enough so even you getting covid makes no difference so statistics is i mean the jury is out on that one right Uh, according to sir cleveland uh, clinic uh, the research done by them they said that uh, uh, covid antibodies was not found in uh, the secretions uh, through uh, in vaginal secretions and other secretions but uh, so what is the risk of mother to fetus transmission uh, post covid and can a covid positive mother breastfeed i think yes uh, so you would like to take that question yes sir yes sir Yeah, COVID positive mother. See, we clearly know that there's no contraindication to breastfeeding. Of course, there are reasons like if you're on anti-cancer drugs, if you're HIV positive on drugs, and basically mothers got psychiatric illness. COVID positive mother not breastfeeding is a big complete no-brainer. They must breastfeed. Number one. Number two, we understand the transplacental spread of COVID is actually much. There have been some case reports because children born to mothers who have COVID positive surface swabs have come as positive. Now we also need to understand the most important thing is to encourage all pregnant mothers to have the COVID vaccine. because there's still a taboo about actually getting vaccinated when you're pregnant and i can still see 
Now the baby being six months, the mother's not vaccinated as yet. So I think we should ask obstetric colleagues to actually encourage pregnant mothers to get vaccinated. So uh, leaving the, the scientific part apart, I think the most important thing is to try and avoid the sequelae and the problems secondary to COVID than actually trying to think about the secretions which may contribute to the spread of COVID. Uh, wasn't, uh, uh, we have a question from Dr. Mahajan. He says that his uh, child is eight years old, tested uh, COVID positive two weeks ago, uh, and he suffered diarrhea and cough, but he's still persisting to have cough. So how to manage it? I think it is like for any respiratory infection, the cough is the last symptom which probably clears us, and it's going to take maybe a little longer during. Usually, I think for most children, it is like five to seven days. For some children, it is a possibility that uh, it can stay in for a longer duration of time. I think if it is not troubling him, troubling his sleep, or if it is not disturbing his day-to-day -day activities, if it is like occasional cough, I think there is nothing to be worried about it. Uh, so, uh, basic question that uh, there is a surge in MISC cases with Omicron in states like Maharashtra and Delhi. Uh, where is the wave tailing? I think uh, that has been answered that uh, uh, post uh, MIC cases post Omicron are not seen so frequently. So you would like to add, sir, Vasan, sir? No, see, India as such is no, it's like each state is a country. So we cannot compare, like Maharashtra is always the, I mean, starts from Maharashtra, then subsequently it goes to Delhi and uh, maybe UP and all, other, I don't know, it goes on to multiple states. So we have to see our state and we have to, because uh, accordingly only we can decide. So so you'll have a larger period of plateau, like rather than uh, going up and down, because the country as such is huge. So like if Maharashtra is having Omicron MIC cases now, we will probably in Tamil Nadu, I mean, I'm in Tamil Nadu, so I can say that in Tamil Nadu, we will have probably in the end of March or even April, May. So Depends on which or state it, you are in. It may in. Never, never happen. Let's keep or it. Or may never happen also. Yeah. We don't know. So. And also one more thing is that I think we have probably started understanding MISC better. That could be one of the so. reasons why people are more aware and probably just ignoring a lot of cases and which were thought to be MISC in the past. So that's how science evolves, isn't it? As you get older, you get wiser. Or I wish of you hope. So uh, with that, uh, we come to an end of question answer session, sir. So uh, any any uh, closing comments which you would like to add, uh, Kesavali, sir? Yeah, see, I, I think basically what we need to try and understand is to be vigilant, keep eyes and ears open, and do not forget COVID-associated behavior is the only thing that is going to save us. So don't forget mask, gloves, hygiene, face mask, and making sure children eat healthy food. And one of the studies which are published, which I published from our hospital tells you that the nutritional status does not make a difference to your uh, you know, risk of getting COVID or not. Whether you're undernourished, malnourished, overnourished, or obese, your risk of getting COVID is equivocal in all the groups. So we have to be extra vigilant, vaccinate all children, and look at more recent scientific evidence, and do not use drugs arbitrarily, and use children as guinea pigs, which is completely unfair, because I still feel there's a lot of prescriptions which still carry antibiotics and steroids for COVID, even though the doctors know that they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing. So my humble request is to all the colleagues to be treating cases simply and let things pass. And I'm sure this way will get passed as well and we'll get back to normalcy. Wishing you all the very best and God bless you all. Thank you. Vasan, sir, as, as we are coming to an end, a uh, uh, last comment from you with a, also a question that ways to prevent uh, severity of COVID in children. Sorry, sorry. What uh, does it mean? ways to prevent or reduce severity of COVID in children. This is what, uh, what prevents uh, to reduce the severity, severity. How okay. can you reduce the severity of COVID in children? How can you reduce the severity? I mean, see, uh, I mean, as such, the COVID as such in children is a mild uh, variant. So predominantly, I keep repeating the same statement again and again, 90 to 95% is going to be only milder variant, so which is not going to cause much of a problem. So there is a, see, if you do something to reduce the severity, like give early steroid or something, that is going to cause problem for you, the child a little later. So that is the biggest worry. And the disease as such is a very mild problem. There shouldn't be anything which probably should be tried to intervene. So they have tried uh, giving plasma, they have tried even giving this monoclonal antibodies, but that is all a little expensive and probably not warranted. There's one thing maybe you can try remdesivir, 
which probably is against uh, the living guidelines of WHO is against it to give remdesivir right now. It has come like two, three days back, I think. So, so that India reduces government the virus. Yeah. Indian government has clearly said no remdesivir, no yeah. monolipid so, to children. And that's in today's paper, actually. Correct. So I think we shouldn't, as such, it is a mild disease. What are you trying to reduce it for the, and what drug are you trying to do? So that was an informative like session, so I would like to hand over uh, to Nishita to uh, give a formal vote of thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you so Thank much, you. sir. It has been such an honor to be a part of this wonderful event. The event was so interactive that in the process, I have also learned a lot. I'm very much sure that attending doctors have also enjoyed the whole session. On the behalf of Clarnet, now I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to all our esteemed speakers, Dr. Dhanashekhar Kesavelu and Dr. Vasant Kumar S., and also our esteemed moderator, Dr. Yash Banayat, sir, for giving us your precious time. Thank you so much. Sincere thanks to the heads of various departments who handled the events throughout. A wide round of applause and thanks to all the participants who made the event so memorable one. Finally, I would like to thank all of you for your presence here, for making the time to be with us today and helping us make the event grand success. Thank you all of you once again. Thank you. Have a great time ahead. And please be safe, keep sanitizing, wash your hands and wear masks. Thank you, respected teachers.